Final ending of keeping it off, part one down below. Do you need more? Shannon inquired, rising to collect Randy's plate as he finished his meal. Um, only if it's no bother, Randy stammered. You should come by this set of night, Kathy suggested. And why said I? Randy queried. We're making pizza from scratch, Shannon revealed, setting a fresh plate before him. I'll get you shaping the dough like an expert soon enough, Shannon chuckled, giving him a playful peck on the cheek. Randy pondered how Briah and Farley might enjoy learning pizza making, particularly the dough flipping part. Yet, a surge of sadness hit him, he missed having Briah, Farley, and Danielle to care for. Resigned, he polished off his second generous serving and passed on a third. While sipping strong coffee and nibbling on lemon sorbet, Randy shared that he was a welder with two week offshore shifts. Occasionally, Chris Fontenot needed him in the shop to complete orders. Mostly, he spent his seven days off attending to chores like laundry and mowing. Claude, visibly intoxicated and frowning, bluntly said, You won't be dating my daughter, upon learning of Randy's past incarceration in Texas. Kathy retorted to Claude, and had your father not been Judge Brown, you'd likely have been in prison too. He's paid his dues, learned from it, and is now a responsible homeowner and neighbor. It seems I won't be making pizza after all, Randy remarked, finishing his sorbet. You most certainly will, Kathy insisted. Even if it means I have to tie him down, you're joining us in the kitchen. Sir, I get it, Randy responded softly. Having had Briah and Danielle, I'd also scrutinize anyone they associated with, ensuring they're suitable. I'm not a kid, Shannon protested, standing tall. In your father's eyes, you always will be, Randy said with a smile, locking eyes with Shannon. But sir, as your wife mentioned, I've served my time, learned from it, and now I'm committed to being a responsible neighbor and citizen, Randy explained to Claude. The pizza making starts sharp at six, Kathy chimed in. Make sure you're here, Shannon added, teasingly tapping Randy's arm with a playful gesture. Sir, Randy inquired, seeking clarification. Claude, feeling defeated, gestured dismissively and decided to open a bottle of Wheat Turling's beer. I appreciate the chat, but it's been a long day for me, Randy confessed. The cleanup was pretty exhausting. Shannon escorted him to the door, where she gave him a tight hug and a warm, lingering kiss. Said at six o'clock, she reminded him as they noticed the porch light flickering on and off. Despite the daylight, the flickering light was noticeable. Understood, Randy replied with a smile, hugging her back before they parted ways, just as the light flickered once more. Randy, walking home, overheard Shannon's playful protest. Back at his place, Randy took a shower, lost in thoughts of their recent interaction. He reminisced about the day's events, focusing on the shared physical exertion and the playful moments. The next day, Randy busied himself with gardening and tidying up the house. On Friday, his schedule was disrupted by the late arrival of Brian Loudermilk the claims adjuster from Young Insurance, who accidentally hit Randy's dumpster with his car, visibly intoxicated. Randy swiftly contacted the Baylor Lake Police and then reached out to Elizabeth Cowder at Young Insurance to report the incident, ensuring that Brian would not drive again in his condition. Hey, just needed to use your restroom, Brian mumbled, clearly inebriated, as he exited the bathroom. He chuckled while snapping a few shots of the damaged walls. Glancing at the patio doors, Brian mentioned he could have opted for the pool, but thought Randy would rather he use the indoor bathroom. It's not like your kids haven't had their fair share of accidents in it, right? Brian chuckled again, losing his balance suddenly. Careful, the floor is wet here, he noted, steadying himself against the wall. Mr. Loudermilk, Elizabeth boomed as she entered. Oh no, what are you doing here? I'm working, okay. I'm working, Brian retorted to his boss. Ah, uh, Mr. Wilson, our paths cross again, Officer Rochelle Esposito greeted with a smile as Randy opened the door. The officer proceeded to conduct a sobriety test on Brian Loudermilk. Randy, feeling uncomfortable, looked away from the scene unfolding before him. What's going on? Shannon gasped, rushing inside. I saw a police car out front. It's nothing, Shannon. Just dealing with someone who had too much to drink and got behind the wheel, Randy explained. Are you all right? Shannon pressed, clinging to Randy, searching his face for reassurance. Yes, dear, I'm fine, Randy assured her, while Officer Rochelle read Brian his rights. Oh, thank goodness, Shannon sighed, nestling into Randy's embrace, protective over her partner. Did this carpet match the one upstairs? Elizabeth inquired, descending the stairs. Yes, the carpet matched the one in the hallway in the master bedroom, Randy replied. But the blue in the other bedrooms. Can't say I understand that choice. He noticed Shannon's hold tighten. Shannon shot a cold look at the striking brunette who had intruded into her domain. Forty-two inches, was it? Elizabeth guessed, eyeing the empty space on the wall where a TV once hung. Actually, it was fifty-four inches. Caught a sale at Miller's, Randy corrected. The persistent beeping of the tow truck signaled Randy that Huval's Texaco had swiftly heated Officer Esposito's call to tow Brian Loudermilk's vehicle. Elizabeth snapped a few more shots, bid Randy and Shannon a pleasant day, then exited through the garage left ajar. Our house is always lively on Friday nights, Shannon shared. You never know what my dad might come up with. I'm heading to Chuck's for a burger and a cold one, then hitting the golf course next door, Randy suggested. 
I'm all for golf, Shannon exclaimed. While Shannon professed her love for golf, much like she had for bowling, her skill in both was lacking. However, she reveled in the playful actions and postures each game allowed. By the seventh hole, Randy stopped scoring, simply captivated by the young woman's playful antics. For their pizza-making session, Shannon sported red denim shorts and a white halter. Claude was happy with the new case of beer, and both Kathy and Shannon were pleased with their fresh bouquets. Randy found joy in mastering the pizza dough toss, making three pizzas altogether. He imagined Briah and Farley would have enjoyed flinging and spinning the dough, while Danielle would have delighted in smearing the sauce and sprinkling cheese, albeit more of it ending up on her and the kitchen surfaces than the dough itself. Randy pondered, was it really Heather I loved, or her kids? As they served the first pizza, a tipsy Claude inquired, how many did he drop? None, Shannon chuckled, planting a kiss on Randy's cheek. Anna would have been proud. They devoured nearly three pizzas, the chilled beers perfectly complementing the meal. As Randy prepared to leave, a tipsy Shannon, standing on the porch, affectionately said, I love you. I have deep feelings for you too, Randy confessed. For reheating the pizza, Shannon advised with a tap on the leftovers, use a skillet with a bit of olive oil. Got it, Randy mused, pondering if he had any olive oil at home. I love you, Shannon murmured, her arms wrapped around his neck. She kissed him deeply, then pulled back, her large brown eyes searching as for answers. I understand you're hurting, she whispered, leaning in for another kiss. But I'm determined to hear you say it back. You will love me too. Shannon, as they stood at her doorstep, mentioned their routine. We attend the 915 Mass at St. Elizabeth by the lake, as she let Randy inside her home. Randy hesitated, I'm not really into that, he admitted. Shannon's response was firm, it's not about belief. We attend Mass at 915. Please dress appropriately, she stated before closing the door. Post Mass, they joined friends for a sumptuous brunch at side-by-side -side steaks. Randy, eyeing a mimosa, barely touched it before Shannon claimed it with a playful smile. He shrugged off the loss with a laugh, settling instead for a strong, flavorful coffee alongside his breakfast. Come Monday, Randy was swamped with preparations for his upcoming two-week offshore work. Amidst organizing his life, sorting bills, clearing perishables, and managing household chores, Heather appeared, children absent, to return Randy's Toyota. Confronted with Heather's presence, Randy perceived her in a stark new light. Heather's appearance, stripped of its usual facade, revealed tired eyes, marked skin, and gray streaked, unkempt hair, prompting a stark realization in Randy. Confronting her, Randy accused, you're scared, aren't you? Terrified of failing, of the possibility that trying might lead to defeat. So, you choose to quit, to self-destruct, avoiding effort to escape failure. Heather remained silent, her actions speaking as she relinquished the car and house keys with a clinking sound on the counter. The room was thick with unsaid words until Heather, with a tentative smile and a shrug, responded to Randy's inquiry about the children. Breaking a pause, Heather mentioned, I found the ring, retrieving it from her purse. Damien passed it to Robert, his cousin, for hosting us. Randy's reply was curt as he took the ring, masking the sting of the gesture. Heather inquired about the cost of a ride to Kimball, looking ready to depart. You know, Heather, I don't need that car, Randy replied, detaching his house keys from the inexpensive keychain. You should keep it. Randy had initially considered offering the car to Shannon, who preferred biking everywhere. When shown a sleek silver Alfa Romeo Giulia tie, Shannon had simply smiled and revealed her own set of keys. Randy then contemplated selling the car to fund his house repairs, considering the insurance deductible he faced. However, it was Heather and her children who truly needed the reliable vehicle. Heather softly thanked him and started to walk away, then paused to touch the damaged sheet rock, a reminder of past conflicts. I'm sorry, she whispered before hurrying out. Randy, standing in the doorway, expressed his concern, you need to seek assistance. Heather, it's important, for your sake and your children's. On Tuesday, Randy carefully checked his garage door before leaving. Shannon's sudden appearance at his window, disheveled and in a light robe, startled him. She kissed him quickly and wished him well, her sleepy affection evident. Randy watched as she returned home, where Kathy stood at the doorway, and then he left for work, pondering the complexities of their lives and his own thoughts as he drove. Meeting got cancelled, Randy explained briefly. Did she find someone else? The man jeered. Someone capable, perhaps. No, even worse. She's with your ex now, Randy retorted sharply. I don't care who started it, I'm ending it right here, the foreman growled. Another word from either of you, and you're out. Don't believe me. Test it, understood. Yes sir, Randy responded. Yes sir, what a suck up, the man mocked Randy. Walker, you're done. Out. And I'll be speaking to your contact at Tri Carter, got it. The foreman said, gesturing towards the exit. This is the problem, Bob Walker burst out. We're all too scared of offending someone, can't speak our minds without worrying. Right, and you've offended the wrong person. Me, the foreman shouted. Some men who had seen the whole exchange offered their sympathy to Randy, but he was mostly left to himself. Many understood that working long shifts and leaving their partners alone had led to many broken engagements, ruined holidays, and failed marriages. 
but the pay is too good to pass up, the worker said quietly, thinking of his own financial woes. After a challenging two-week shift, monitoring a storm in the Atlantic, Randy came back to find his truck vandalized. The windshield and tires on one side were badly damaged. The office informed him that they had reported the incident and gave him the police report for his insurance. I bet it was that jerk walker, suggested a co-worker from Tri Carter. Let's head to Pinoak, it's on the way for you, Wilson. Arriving home, Randy noticed the smell of fresh paint and a strong chemical scent, probably from the new colorful carpet. He spotted a wicker basket on the counter and his pile of unopened mail. The light pink complemented the deep shag carpet beautifully. In the kitchen, the ice-yellow walls stood out, especially against the antique brass fittings of the cabinets and drawers. The formal dining room, unused by Randy, Heather, and the kids, was striking with its deep forest green walls. Someone's been busy, Randy commented to himself. A cut crystal bowl on a new side table between two recliners caught his eye. Inside, pale pink silk roses were delicately placed by Shannon, adding a touch of elegance. Such things aren't practical with kids around, Randy remarked. That would be the first thing they'd go for. We don't have kids, Randy reminded himself as he moved his duffel bag towards the garage and the washing machine. Upstairs, he noticed the old carpet replaced by dark hardwood floors. His bedroom was mostly the same, except for the new dark brown hardwood floors and the red oriental rug under the bed. A serene forest painting hung above the bed, depicting a mother deer and her fawns. Randy always slept on the right side of the bed, but now his pillows and alarm clock were on the left. The bed had new linens he didn't recognize, striped in green, pink, and white, and a cream comforter with a red design. The bathroom had updates too, a new straight shower rod, a simple white shower liner flanked by a natural fiber curtain, and a matching mat on the hardwood floor that replaced old linoleum. Fresh towels hung neatly by the closet. Yes ma'am, someone's been busy, Randy noted again. Do you like it? Shannon asked, her voice eager, standing in the bathroom doorway. I'm not sure, Randy replied, observing her casual attire, her long blonde hair and a ponytail, giving her a youthful appearance. I really hope you like it. I wanted to make this a place you'd be proud of, Shannon said anxiously, looking for Randy's approval. So, let's see the new setup, Randy said, earning a warm smile in response. Every time Randy glimpsed Farley's empty room, it pained him. Now, the space was transformed with a desk, an office chair, and a laptop. A pair of wingback chairs nestled around an ottoman, flanked by a side table and lamp, and the walls were lined with four bookcases beside the window. It's a study for schoolwork and stuff, Shannon explained. Right, I see that, Randy nodded. Previously, Randy had only entered the girls' room with Officer Rochelle Esposito. The emptiness was too much to bear. But now, it resembled a fairy tale princess's chamber, adorned with soft, plush, and delicate decorations. This room just screamed girly to me, Shannon murmured. The guest bathroom was tidied, though largely unchanged. On the ground floor, Randy noticed the guest room was refreshed with antique white paint but otherwise remained untouched. The nearby bathroom was also neatened. Do you like it? Shannon asked eagerly. Yes, of course, what's not to like? Randy responded, puzzled by her concern. But Shannon, my insurance won't cover all these changes. Don't stress about that, Shannon reassured, hugging him. But you do like it, right? Really, it's stunning, could be featured in a magazine, Randy complimented, giving her a kiss. But do you really like it? She persisted after they parted. Yes, Shannon, I do like it, he confirmed. We're having stuffed pork chops for dinner. Is 6.30 okay? Shannon mentioned. 6.30 sounds perfect, Randy agreed. Then, a thought struck him. By the way, who decided to move my side of the bed? I need easy access to the bathroom, Shannon said with a playful grin, walking towards the front door. Hold on, how did you get into my house? Randy suddenly questioned. Uh, Heather returned her keys, Shannon asked, lifting Heather's old keys. Randy glanced at the counter, noting the wicker basket's presence. Memories of Heather bringing back the keys to the house surfaced in his mind. He recalled removing the keys from the keyring and placing them on the counter where the basket now rested. Yet, Randy couldn't recall seeing Shannon enter his house after Heather's departure. 6.30, Randy echoed, deciding to dismiss his concerns about the keys and how Shannon acquired them. After dinner, as Randy yawned for the third time amidst his strawberry sorbet and sipping rich espresso, Kathy softly proposed that Randy should head home and rest. Shannon escorted Randy out, stopping at the Browns' modest porch. Your, I mean, your pillows are. Randy started. We're not married, Shannon interjected firmly. No shared sleeping arrangements until then. I, okay, but, the pillows, Randy fumbled. I've got some of those my pillow brand pillows, Shannon casually mentioned. They can stay there. Oh, and that old mattress. It had a lingering odor from that Damon guy. Damien, Randy corrected. Damon, Damien, whatever, Shannon dismissed. But it reeked. I bought one of those purple mattresses. I hope you find it comfortable. I adore it, but if you don't, we can exchange it. It has a warranty. I'm sure I like it, Randy smiled. Anything's better than that old couch. Good night. Love you, Shannon said, then paused as the porch light clicked on. Dad, just saying good night, okay. 
Good night, Randy chuckled, crossing the street. Randy appreciated the new mattress, though it felt odd to sleep on the unfamiliar side of the bed. With a shrug, he shifted Shannon's pillows and settled comfortably into his preferred side, quickly drifting off to sleep. The aroma of coffee and bacon, along with the sound of pots and pans clanging, awakened him. Peering out the window, Randy noticed the absence of light. Shifting around, he glanced at his clock radio, which read 8.17 a.m. Morning, sleepyhead, Shannon greeted him with a bright smile. Waffles for breakfast. Good morning, lively lady, Randy greeted. These blackout curtains are amazing, aren't they? Shannon said brightly as she poured the first scoop of batter onto the grill. Learn this from my mom. It's the best way to avoid a mess and get the right amount every time. After Shannon expertly cooked four waffles, Randy playfully lifted her off her feet from behind, peppering her neck and cheek with kisses as she giggled and wriggled. Do you think about having kids? Randy asked abruptly. Definitely, maybe four, Shannon replied, turning to embrace him. Are you ready to admit it? I, I, Randy hesitated. I'll get it out of you, Shannon teased, guiding him towards the coffee with a gentle hip bump. Randy ended up with extra bacon while they shared the waffles equally. After breakfast, Shannon, announcing a swim, shed her tea to reveal her striped bikini and dove into the pool. Randy lingered over his coffee, then changed into his swim trunks. You should try wearing those, what are they? Speedos, Shannon commented as Randy joined her in the water. We should come back here tonight for a midnight swim, Randy suggested. Sure, Shannon responded, her tone suggesting otherwise. Too soon for Randy, it was Tuesday. Anticipating the gentle wake up, he found Shannon, disheveled and sleepy, at his truck window. Take care, there's a storm brewing off the coast, she murmured. I've been keeping an eye on it, Randy assured. Be safe, she said, kissing him goodbye before walking away. Across the street, Kathy greeted him with a smile, while a curtain twitched in an upstairs window as he left. Fourteen days later, Randy's truck was untouched when they returned from their trip. The hurricane had veered toward the east side of Florida and proceeded along the coastline of South and North Carolina. Meanwhile, another storm loomed in the Gulf, with yet another brewing in the Atlantic. Your mom and Uncle Jack, are they not like your step-parents since they're married? They're coming over for pizza on Saturday, Shannon mentioned as Randy started doing laundry. Hey, love, about that storm, it seems they're evacuating the oil rigs as we speak. Yes, I saw more boats arriving as I left, Randy replied. And when did you chat with my mom? Yesterday. She seems very sweet. And she's bringing zinnias for us to replace those that Heather accidentally ruined. And Uncle Jack, did you know, he's quite the character, isn't he? Shannon hinted with a playful tone. Maybe you could teach him how to make pizza. He's not that bad, Randy chuckled, giving Shannon a playful pat. Sure, he is, Shannon retorted, leaning in for a kiss. He's quite the character, indeed, Randy agreed with a grin. So, what have you been up to, besides planning my garden with my mom? I have a report due for my world economics class, thinking of focusing on the oil industry. Considering all this talk about the Green New Deal, if they implement even a bit of it, it could upset our economy and boost China's, Shannon explained. I caught some of that, Randy confessed. When Janice and Uncle Jack arrived, Shannon proudly showed off the updates to the house, including the new linens in the guest room. These are those famous my pillows from the commercials, Shannon told Uncle Jack. Feel free to take them with you, we can always grab more. But what about the pizza making? Janice inquired. I bet Jack's going to fumble it on his first try. I think he'll manage, Shannon responded warmly, looking at Jack. Randy's quite skilled, he'll be a good teacher. And Janice, did you bring the zinnias? I can't figure out what went wrong with the last ones, but they're in a sorry state. I'm not sure if you've noticed, Jack mentioned to Randy while they were preparing their dough. That woman, when she talks, it's always we and us. With Heather, the only we and us I heard were about her and her kids. Randy pondered over Jack's words for a while before agreeing silently, showing his stepfather how to handle the dough properly. Didn't I say? Shannon chuckled, watching the two work the dough. At the gathering, Claude chose not to drink his usual beer and instead sipped on the rich, full-bodied red wine that Jack and Janice brought. Being of a similar age, Claude opened up more, sharing stories about his life and family. Randy was surprised to learn Shannon was the youngest and only daughter among Claude and Kathy's three children. He hadn't known about her brothers. Cecil, he's been in the Navy for how long now? Claude turned to his wife. And Cliff, Clifton, he's doing well for himself in Seattle, working with a telecom company. Just like his father, Kathy added. Claude has been in computer security with ULD for years. That's why we get some perks, Shannon shared with a smile. We attend the 915 Mass, Kathy mentioned to their guests, as they prepared to leave. You're attending church now, Janice inquired, looking at her son. Oh yes, Miss Janice, Shannon confirmed. The next day, Jack questioned whether the mattress in the guest room was new. Randy wasn't sure, but Shannon shared the credit, asking, is it comfortable? Did you have a good night's sleep? Absolutely, even with that strong coffee you served. What was that? Rocket fuel. Jack joked. After indulging in a hearty brunch at the side-by-side -side steakhouse, Jack remarked on the long journey back to Sweet Oak. 
As they were saying goodbye, Janice leaned in to ask Randy, So, when's the big day? Mom, really? Randy responded with a smile. Take care, son, Jack said, extending his hand to Randy. See you, Uncle Jack, Randy said, embracing his stepfather. Love you. Drive safely, okay. Love you too, son, Uncle Jack responded, hugging Randy with warmth. We should get moving, Claude urged. Looks like someone's eager for his afternoon rest, Kathy joked, nudging her husband. And I've got to adjust these dentures. They're just not sitting right, Claude complained. You're not scared of heights, are you? Randy inquired, glancing at Shannon as they settled in the back of the Cadillac Escalade. Not exactly, Shannon replied. I've tried rock climbing and didn't enjoy it much, but it wasn't the height that bothered me. Zip lining in Tennessee was thrilling, though. Why do you ask? Just curious. Until last night, I didn't even know you had siblings. Makes me wonder what else I don't know about you, Randy mused. On Tuesday morning, Shannon was there to send him off with a kiss, wishing him safety and expressing her love. Randy smiled, waving at Kathy and Claude through the window. The area was nearly evacuated due to a tropical depression, which ultimately abated but not before soaking the region heavily. Is Friday still Claude's cooking night? Randy asked Shannon as she visited his place that Tuesday evening. Yes, it is. And guess what? I scored a 91 on my paper about the Green New Deal's economic impact, Shannon shared. My professor thinks it's unlikely to affect us much, but it could influence smaller countries. I have to admit, I only caught half of that, Randy joked. How about we try that Thai place in Kimball on Friday? The one with the hanging gardens. I'd love that, Shannon exclaimed. On Thursday, Randy and Claude had a meeting at Claude's office in MacPherson Hall at the University of Louisiana at DeGarde. Claude was hesitant about his daughter dating Randy, given his past as an ex-con, yet he couldn't deny the fondness that had grown for him. Kathy thinks highly of you, Claude eventually conceded. Uh-huh, I like her too, Randy smiled. And, I do see, Claude said. You two might not think I do, but I notice. Your interactions are respectful. Randy shrugged but nodded. Whenever he tried to move beyond heartfelt kisses, Shannon would kindly redirect his affection. I understand your feelings, Shannon would whisper to Randy. I feel the same, but now isn't the moment for that. Returning home one afternoon, Randy found a pair of plain white cotton panties in his laundry. He held them, hoping the right time would come soon. I can't change my past, sir, Randy said, shaking Claude's hand. I can only progress and avoid the foolish errors of my youth. The Thai food was delicious, though a bit pricey for the small servings. Yet, the flavors were rich and spicy. Randy proposed visiting the New Spoons ice cream parlor in DeGarde for dessert after their hot air balloon ride. Balloon dot 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 were going in one, Shannon exclaimed with joy. The balloon ride lasted about 40 minutes. Randy, familiar with helicopters from urgent evacuations, found the peaceful, slow ascent mesmerizing. Having Shannon, a vibrant young woman, sharing in his awe made the experience even more delightful. As the balloon descended, Randy felt a profound moment approaching. I'm ready to express something, Randy whispered to Shannon, embracing her. MMM. She turned, smiling at him. Actually, I'm ready to express it daily for life, he said, revealing a ring. And I'm ready to listen every day for life, Shannon responded, tears of joy in her eyes. Festive Christmas tunes filled the air as Randy navigated the grocery cart towards the Fuji apples, humming along to the melody. He meticulously examined the apples, selecting the best ones. Still fond of Fuji apples, I see, Heather Aucoin remarked, her smile tinged with melancholy. Oh, hey, how have you been? Randy stuttered, surprised to see a visibly aged Heather by the red delicious apples. Just getting by, Heather replied with a shrug. How are Briah, Farley, and Danielle? Randy inquired, continuing to fill his bag with apples. They're doing well. David, Briah's father, has them at the moment with honey, Heather confessed. Heather had resolved to keep David McMahon in the dark about being Briah's father, wishing to avoid complicating matters further. However, her resolve wavered when she discovered a troubling situation at home and decided to act protectively. In the attorney's office, Honey McMahon, David's spouse, inquired about Briah's siblings. Despite her initial reluctance, Heather found Honey's genuine kindness hard to resist. He's ten months younger than Briah, then there's Danielle, the youngest at six, Heather explained, showing their school photos from her purse. Will they join Briah during her visits? Honey asked. Six, so she's the same age as our Janelle. Briah is the only one related to David, Heather clarified. That seems a bit unfair, Honey commented. Briah gets to visit and they don't and Briah gets a new grandmother while they don't," added David. David's lawyer, Amelia Waters, suggested revising the visitation arrangement to include Farley and Danielle. Heather observed Honey and David eagerly discussing the photos, moved by the thought of their family's excitement. Overwhelmed, Heather silently agreed to the proposal. Did you tell Briah about her father? Randy asked, pulling Heather back from her thoughts. And Farley and Danielle, Heather nodded in agreement. Really, I leave for just a moment, and you're chatting up a charming lady. Shannon teased, playfully nudging Randy. I thought I had you safely tucked away, Randy joked, wrapping his arm around his wife. Janice was overjoyed when Randy called to announce his engagement. 
Uncle Jack shed a few tears when his stepson asked him to be the best man. So, do I keep calling you Uncle Jack? Randy asked. Isn't Dad more fitting? There's nothing wrong with that, son, Jack responded warmly. The first set in September was pleasantly warm. The park behind the St. Elizabeth Parish Public Library was in full bloom with late summer flowers as Randy and Jack stood under the gazebo. Deacon Derek Bergeron, in a sleek gray suit his stepfather bought for him upon becoming a deacon at St. Elizabeth Catholic Church, wore a deep red tie passed down from his stepfather. Shannon was stunning as she walked down the aisle, leaning on her father's arm. Her wedding dress, a legacy from Kathy Brown, made Randy realize how fortunate he was. Seeing Shannon in her wedding dress was a moment to cherish. Later, in their New Orleans hotel room, Shannon's elegant appearance and her light blue ensemble made Randy feel incredibly lucky and full of love. I love you, Randy declared, hastening to join her. I know, Shannon replied softly, beaming. I love you too. Come here, my husband. Their intimate moments were filled with love and affection, marking the beginning of their new life together. Oh no, definitely, Shannon stated with conviction. We're planning on having four children, starting from tonight. I, uh, did you guys get married? Heather interrupted, her query breaking the intense connection between Randy and Shannon. Yes, indeed, Shannon replied with a smile, breaking away from her husband's gaze. On the 4th of September, Heather almost chuckled as she noticed the recognition dawn on Shannon's face when she spotted Heather Aukoin. Heather placed her red delicious apples in her cart, ready to move on. Well, congratulations, Heather offered, her tone tinged with melancholy. Shannon was updating me about Briah, Farley, and Danielle, Randy told Shannon. Really, how are they doing? Shannon eagerly inquired. They're doing wonderfully, Heather responded with a nostalgic smile. As I mentioned to Randy, they're currently with David and Honey. David is Briah's dad, Randy clarified to Shannon. David, isn't he the one who was released from jail? The one who caused trouble at your place? Shannon inquired, her expression one of concern. No, you're thinking of Damien, Heather corrected her. David is actually a great person. David McMahon was indeed respectable. He never ridiculed Farley for his clothing choices, nor did he mock Briah, Danielle, or Farley for their use of makeup. Rather, David highlighted the benefits of embracing a more masculine demeanor to Farley. And you're the eldest brother, David pointed out during a fishing trip in the Atchafalaya Basin with Farley and his son, DJ. You have three younger sisters who might attract attention. You might need to look out for them, you know. Farley mulled over this new perspective. And there's your younger brother, David continued, casting his fishing line, who's going to teach him to throw a football or ride a bike. I can ride a bike, DJ, piped up, even without training wheels. David queried, checking his fishing line and noticing the bait was gone without a catch. When Robert inquired about when Briah, Danielle, and Farley might return, Heather resolved that they would not be coming back to the trailer. A swift call to Honey ensured that Briah, Danielle, and Farley were protected from Robert Hebert. The support center on Bank Street was now collaborating with Heather, having assisted her in securing an apartment and aiding her in the search for stable employment. I, good, Randy stated emphatically. Miss He, Heather, if there's anything we can do to help, please tell us, Shannon implored. Nothing you can do, it needs to be my own effort, Heather responded with a broad smile. But thank you all the same. My comment, Heather just can't seem to get it together. That's the second good man she threw away for that loser Damien. What is it about Damien that she can't seem to let go? She was finally happy, her kids were finally happy and had a stable safe home. And as soon as Damien gets out of prison, she goes running to him without a second thought.